Welcome to ICATS, the International Consortium of Advanced Technologies and Security, and our video and audio and slide series for Thermography Certification Level 1. This is, of course, only a fraction of that curriculum and covers only the basics of thermodynamics. This is video one of three videos in the introduction to thermodynamics. While the entire certification level one thermographers will involve more detailed college level uh, lectures on physics and thermodynamics, just like certifications issued by the Cal State University system, which this is not, no detailed knowledge of the calculations or formulae will be required. However, some knowledge, a working knowledge, of thermodynamics is required and you will need to be able to discuss the basic principles behind the first and second laws of thermodynamics and think through the issues during your tests. This is an easy presentation. It's just an introduction and thermodynamics is the study of how thermal energy moves about temperatures, about heat and work, and of course this series will deal with how that relates to thermal imaging when you're on the job. Thermodynamics lays down the laws of all of science. And while this may sound strange, it is true. All scientific laws are based on thermodynamics, and while we may use the terms first and second law of thermodynamics, often they are simply called the first and second laws, or the first and second laws of science. Men have gazed up at the stars for thousands of years, but the Greek thinkers misdirected us at several key points. The first was thinking that the universe was round or spherical, to them a series of round crystal spheres. The Greco-Roman Ptolemy cued from the Greek thought, and since everything we could see, including shooting stars, fell to the earth, we must be at the center of the earth, and at that, at the bottom, the trash heap, if you will, where things that were imperfect fell to. Nothing in the heavens was considered to be imperfect. It was all perfect and unchanging. And of course, Galileo changed that sometime later. But at that same time, the nation of Israel believed something differently. They thought the universe was relatively flat, described as being like a tent, and that it was being stretched out. Strange. Several hundred years later, the Greeks completely disagreed, and they disagreed on a false philosophic uh, pretext on that. 2,700 years later, Hubble, looking at the hail scope in my own backyard up on Mount Palomar, Mount Wilson, proved that it was expanding. And half a century later, in 2003, a little more than half a century, 70 some odd years later, the WMAP isotropic satellite proved it was relatively flat, go figure. But it wasn't until the Hale scope here on Mount Palomar that we started to realize that the infrared spectrum would give us better information about our solar system. Images such as this one were, uh, where the light is mostly infrared and the colors assigned to different energy levels within that spectrum show us a lot about the universe we could never see before. So there are two takeaways from this. First, that the thermodynamic laws apply to events trillions of miles away as well as inside your own body and even in the smallest of molecules down to the angstrom level and below. And second, infrared light can be used to image stars, especially supernova, which have all been discovered since Hubble. In fact, he is the one that first realized that some of the novae or clouds that were up in the up into the star were actually not in our galaxy at all. And he's the one looking through the Hale scope that discovered that the Andromedean galaxy, for instance, was many times farther than the farthest star away from us and literally expanded our understanding of the universe. Hubble also was up at, up at uh, Mount Palomar and the Hubble scope is of course named for him. One more issue. Einstein's general and special laws of relativity, relativity denied Lorentz's luminiferous ether theory, which claimed that light traveled through some kind of a medium which he called ether, and it was a luminiferous ether because that's the medium that light traveled through. What you didn't learn in school, but they're just starting to tell you now, is that Einstein's theory missed 95% of the mass of the universe. That number is actually growing. His friend Lorentz was right. Now, 
just in case there are those who are shocked by my last statement. Uh, while I have been claiming that for better than 20 years, let me first say that you are familiar with the dark matter and dark energy theories, or at least have heard of them. Allow me to quote Robert B. Laughlin, Nobel Laureate in Physics, Endowed Chair in Physics at Stanford University, from his book, A Different Universe, Reinventing Physics from the Bottom Down. He says, and I quote, It is ironic that Einstein's most creative work, the general theory of relativity, should boil down co to conceptualizing space as a medium, when his original premise was that no such medium existed. The word ether is ex has extremely negative connotations in the theoretical physics world because of its past association with the opposition to relativity. It turns out that such matter exists. Subsequent studies with large particle accelerators have now led us to understand that space is more like a piece of window glass than an ideal Newtonian emptiness. It is filled with stuff that is normally transparent but can be made visible by hitting it sufficiently hard to knock out a part. The modern concept of the vacuum of space, confirmed by everyday experimentation, is a relativistic ether. But we do not call it this because it is taboo." End quote. Well, well, I tend to be iconoclastic and what more a lofty icon than Albert to clast but I digress. Here we have an image of the sun, color shifted and cooled until we can see the sunspots really well and see again when we study even the sun using infrared and thermography of a different kind, we can learn more about the sun. But let's return to the first law of thermodynamics. We'll cover a little bit more of that later and how Joel uh, explained that and really came to determine that that was true and what he based that on. But that law states simply, no energy is currently being created or destroyed. If not, then what is happening here? What we see is a lot of energy being redistributed as heat and light to the earth and to every other place in the physical universe. And this is how thermodynamic laws were developed. Not only by studying the sun, but steam engines, when they noted that more energy put, the more energy you put in, the more you could extract. That's where Joel came along, and where he said the energy had to be preserved in some way or another. But we'll get to that later. Even in the various earth sciences, we find the laws of thermodynamics not only being applied, but even applied to understanding heat and how it works at all levels. The second law states that energy is always becoming less organized, that is, entropy or disorganized energy is always increasing. Like the image of the sun, the heat seen in this Google Earth image is leaving the water and hitting satellites hundreds of miles away from the Earth. To understand why, we need to go to the fourth law that was elucidated, that is the fourth thermodynamic law discovered, if you will, or described at least. But then it was put into first place, and since number one was already taken, uh, they called it the zero law, or the zeroth law of thermodynamics. And that is, energy is always trying to equalize itself, and it will continue to do so until all the energy in that system is equalized as much as it possibly can. I think this is just a corollary to the second law, but apply this to rain. It evaporates from these oceans, say, drops onto the mountains, and then if not stopped by a lake, runs down until it goes to the ocean again. That's the very process. It flows down the thermodynamic gradient, in this case a, a gravity-driven pressure gradient, until it gets to its lowest point. Then it's equalized and the zeroth law is satisfied. But doggone, we're back to that pesky Jewish guy they called Isaiah again. How did he know that? He described that system. But there is what, there's more to thermodynamics in earth sciences than meets the eye. In fact, that is all we have seen thus far, radiation from bodies near and far. But how else does energy travel? This is a picture I took on the island of St. Eustatius in the Caribbean, where I was inspecting 
the ship in the middle of the photo, actually, a super tanker. But the photo itself I took because I saw a thermal process that was unmistakable. Look at the cloud. Let's talk about the atmosphere now. Uh, not the point zero three five percent of it that's CO2, which is normally the subject, that very, very, very tiny fraction of CO2 in the atmosphere. Rather, that's right, by the way, it's, it's three hundredths of one percent of it is CO2. Rather, just the lowest level, the troposphere, which is about all you can see here. In particular, there's another principle here, and that is an adiabatic condition. That is, a place where there is no heat exchange going on. That's at the bottom of the clouds. Notice that flat layer? It is an adiabat. That means it's a place where there's no heat being exchanged. The Earth is heated by the sun in a process named after one of the early scientists studying thermodynamics named Carnot. It's called a Carnot cycle, where the surface is warmed by the sunlight, which in, heat, in turn heats the air immediately above it and does some work. Those gas molecules vibrate faster and so become farther apart, according to Boyle's Law, another early person studying thermodynamics, and they try to move upward. However, because there is a cooler layer of air at the top, and because those two, that temperature differential causes them not to mix very well, this layer develops, preventing much of the work uh, done. Uh, it basically, all that can happen if the adiabat expands, or uh, the idea of uh, adiabat is lifted because there's too much heat, like in the tropics, is the clouds are lifted upwards. The adiabat moves farther away from the Earth. But much of the energy or work done is stopped by the adiabat. In a vortex, such as a hurricane, that adiabat is broken in a very violent way. A column starts up, air starts moving in, starts rotating because it has to change direction from horizontal to vertical, starts rotation, and you have a vortex. Now, there's actually a lot of them in the atmosphere that you normally don't see. They're not large, they're not dangerous, they don't move that much air. Hurricanes and tornadoes are, of course, exceptions to that. They can be very damaging. But that's what happens. The adiabat is broken by too much pressure from underneath. First, the cloud particles are convecting. That's why they're rising up so high and blocking the sun from where I'm at. Can you see that? As particles of gas are warmed, that is, the normal atmospheric airs, plus the particles of water who have lost enough energy to condense and now are visible. About the same amount of, of moisture around them, but it's in solution. You can't see it. When they condense, become out of solution, light can bounce off each particle. It does so by the trillions, and you have a cloud form. That's why the, the, the moisture there is visible and the other place it isn't. Okay. But as, as particles of gas are warmed, they rise and cooler gases drop. So this is convection inside the cloud. Okay, another, another early scientist, Lord Kelvin, his name was Samuel Thomson, without the P, was, uh, uh, noticed this and noticed that that generated a little bit of an electrical charge, but more of that at some other time. So thermodynamic processes are virtually everywhere, at all levels, all the time, even in the water below, which convects on even a larger scale than this cloud, a much larger scale, although the atmosphere convects more mass over time over a bigger area. The ocean is much denser and the convections are huge. Let's look at that. Well, here we have it, a map of the convection of the deep currents in the ocean. Two slides back we saw the ocean temperatures directly, which is all you can see with infrared, but realize this is only the surface temperature temperature and many currents affect that. This on the other hand is a virtual superhighway of the ocean convecting slowly virtually all around the world as you can see. Between Washington and Japan the cold current rises, heads, uh, head, then heads south past the equator over Australia gaining heat on the way uh, past past India where another current, another branch of it has risen up and joins back together with it, uh, goes down around the uh, tip of Africa up into Europe, making it much warmer than it would otherwise be according to its uh, elevation. But that, that warm current helps a lot of that. Cools off again up by Greenland, drops back down and heads south. 
Again, there is more larger and much heavier convection with much more heat below than the, the surface current, the, the, the surface heat that we saw several slides ago in this very deep water current. And these are very slow currents that take years and years and years to complete. They're not rapid currents. Okay, well, you're going to have to forgive the pun, but are we getting too deep here? But even under our feet, convection of the rock itself is driving the movement of the plates floating on top of that liquid. Yes, even that is thermodynamic laws relating to, to, to rock and how it flows. There's a core, the degraded core, the center of the earth, which is mostly, I think, nickel and uh, potassium and a few other other minerals that are that are uh, where radioactive potassium is actually degrading giving off that heat and maintaining its heat and this is good because it is that core that's hot that maintains the magnetic flux of the earth and it's this flux that protects us from the solar wind which would otherwise destroy life on earth if that was gone very quickly we would first thing we would do is lose all of our satellites, we would lose uh, a lot of our communications within hours, uh, other, our, our electrical systems would start failing as induction started uh, uh, putting currents into those and, and massive failures would occur there, but eventually life on earth would cease to exist. Uh, so that's a, that's a pretty nice design we've got going on there where, where this convection uh, creates the magnetic flux that life itself depends on. Of course, it depends on many other things that are also uh, nicely in place to, uh, to protect us and keep us alive. But it's interesting. As this convex, it moves, amongst other things, lots of different minerals, but carbon around also. Some of that cools off into pretty little crystal rocks like kimberlites, which then uh, blow up towards the surface in a, from a deep volcanic eruption and put diamonds out on the surface. And so then we can have diamonds for, for our, our watches, uh, we can have diamonds for our uh, wives and our girlfriends, and diamonds for uh, various industrial processes that help reduce friction or actually make friction because uh, certain kinds of sandpapers can be made from that that are not only expensive but very abrasive. Uh, you, can, you can buy diamond bits for your uh, uh, drummels and things like this. Very, very important uh, products made deep in the earth and that convection, that thermodynamics is important in that process even at that level. So everything, both directly and indirectly, is expressed in the laws of thermodynamics. All the laws of science, again, are restatements of the laws of thermodynamics. But we can return to a more interesting application at home and in office different thermal coefficients are directly applicable to your work as a thermographer. Specifically, the coefficient of thermal expansion, which can literally blow things apart. This is a picture from my home, a piece of glass I made a long time ago when I was making art glass. And uh, the various glass forms that are in this bowl, the top iridized layer, the dark layer, uh, was intentionally broken by me to give that effect, uh, specifically coming uh, uh, the yellow coming through the darker glass. However, if you look closer, you'll see several pieces of dichroic glass. Uh, you've all seen dichroic glass in one place or another. There's several pieces uh, on in this piece, and the one that we're concerned with is the one dead center, and it's a little bit hard to see. But uh, here, the one in the center was mismarked by the company that sold me that glass. So the uh, coefficient of expansion, or COE as they refer to it in, uh, in art glass, is, uh, was wrong. It didn't match the rest of the glass used in the bowl. And so that difference was fused into the glass and about a year later the bowl itself had a parting of ways. That is, I heard a loud, uh, not, not too loud of a crack, just a, just a very sharp crack early one Saturday morning and I uh, looked around until I found it the bowl looked just the same except there's a hairline crack in it. Now, uh, it, it broke in half horizontally and this one is now glued together and this picture was taken after it was glued. So it's, it's actually broken in half here and glued together. But solids, liquids, and gases, that is every state of matter 
well, I don't accept plasma now that considering the state of matter, expands when it's heated. Well, plasma does also. And each has a specific coefficient of linear expansion. So here we have a formula which tells us the change in length over the original length is equal to the coefficient of expansion multiplied by the change in temperature or the delta T. Okay, delta T is always change in temperature. Delta in science is the change. So it's the change in temperature. And this changes according to the composition of every mass. Is your driveway cracked? Blame the difference in the COE of the cement itself, and that mixed with, with the sand, the, the, uh, the uh, concrete, if you will, and the gravel that's inside of it. Because that gravel has a different COE than the cement itself. So it expands and contracts, eventually breaking uh, pieces of, of uh, concrete, cracking pieces of concrete. But now let's get to work. This is important in bimetal breakers where the uh, coefficient of, ex of expansion is used to break a circuit if too much energy passes through the device. One metal gets hotter than the other, it flexes differently, and it pops the breaker. And this is the type of breaker that you have at your home. Uh, commercial breakers have a different type that are done by magnetism, but that's not the subject here. They also will pop if they get too hot. But let me show you one more piece of glass that is in our offices at Autech, where we offered infrared services, uh, now that has evolved into the Air Syndicate. Well, while the bowl was somewhat repairable by glue, uh, the image here was taken, uh, there, or the image there was taken after it was glued back together, I created a piece that was not repairable in that same way at least. Exactly the same glass, same company, same mismarked COE, and all of the lighter colored glass on top, you can see the colors in it, are all dichroic glasses, and they were all supposed to be the same coefficient of expansion of the other glass that I was using. Well, it turns out it was uh, there were several pieces in there, and we later figured out which one it was, just by looking at all the various pieces that did actually break. Uh, it was a specific di dichroic piece, and um, uh, so what I did here was I slumped it back uh, over, well, I slumped it over a specific uh, waveform, I slumped another piece of iridized glass, and then glued that glass uh, on it and over the boundaries to break it up a little bit to make it more artistic. Uh, Use these metal rods, these threaded metal rods, to make a frame out of it. It was, after after all, an engineering firm, a uh, a military engineering firm that made a lot of equipment and, and test equipment for the military and glued it back together and hung it up. I like the way it looked, but this was a piece that blew up and was irreparable. The, the only thing you could do is melt it back down and hope the next piece that, uh, that it became didn't break or uh, glue it together like I did here. Okay, so what happens to glass like this can happen to electrical components. And in electrical com components, there are two eventual outcomes. One, it starts in the electrical fire, or two, it simply explodes like this glass did. And the difference is according to the specific weaknesses of the system and the current going through it, how it oxidized the air conditions, you know, is there salt in the air, was it oxidizing more? There's, there's lots of factors in there you don't have to worry about. You don't have to know that you just have to find those problems and identify them so you don't have an expansive problem like we had with this glass where you might have a piece of equipment blowing up. In a mechanical system, slightly different forces can cause even worse results. If a powerful motor or engine seizes because of excess heat destroying the bearings or the, or the various components of the engine, uh, you could have quite a catastrophic event, uh, quite a catastrophic explosion. People can die in these events. This is serious business. Here, just as with uh, with the aquarium or the glass uh, or with the Autech infrared services, now the air syndicate, the thermodynamics are critical to understand. And yes, uh, you can put the pieces back together again, but this is expensive. And like most thermodynamic processes, they are not reversible. A ship fire can cost the upwards of $500 million to repair. Yes, it is costly to have too much heat in the wrong spot. We have discussed at one point or another all three of these methods of heat transfer. 
conduction where the heat travels via vibrational energy through the physical mass that is uh, the ability of the mass to transmit energy by physical contact by vibrating the molecules themselves around it or convection uh, like in the oceans or inside the earth or the sunspots uh, your oven at home or in the cloud that we saw the fluid convects according to their specific heat and their, uh, therefore their density and lastly radiation is what you will be looking at as uh, a thermal imaging uh, expert and uh, energy reaching the surface at uh, and some percent of that emitting to you as infrared light seen by the imaging device itself translated to the colors that you see on the screen and available for analysis by the thermographer what then is the bailiwick the sphere of expertise and influence of the certified thermographer uh, the range is growing as new applications arise, not shown here are fields friends have worked in, including electronic designs where you're studying heat flows inside of a circuit or inside of a box that's holding a circuit, such as a computer box. You have to design those for, so the air flows carry the heat away from the, the, uh, the computer itself. The processors get warm, they need to lose that heat, that's where you have fans. But even in secret aircraft, uh, while they're being designed, now, of course, you have to have the appropriate clearances for that, but the field grows. Uh, pictures here, uh, clockwise from the left, a motor driving a pump on a ship, a geothermal desalination device at SDSU, that was my project. Uh, my wife patiently waiting for me to complete the job. Actually, I broke the circuit. We're going left to right, top to bottom. Uh, and uh, where actual human and animal medical imaging is now being done, in some cases preferred to other kinds of imaging uh, because it's, it's not invasive. It's only seeing things that are coming out. They don't enter you. They don't pass into you. They don't uh, cut into you. So it's non-invasive as this is. It's non-invasive, non-destructive. And then finally, the electrical systems for preventive maintenance and predictive maintenance programs. All of industry needs these at one level or another, and all should be doing them. They would save money and time and replacement cost, and that can be quite costly. In our second module, we will discuss thermodynamics with more emphasis on the electromechanical thermal imaging field itself.